In today's moment of self-care, I decided against eating spicy chips and Parmesan cheese for lunch, and instead I had oatmeal. How are you doing? Hello, my memory of elephants. Uh, today I'm going to be doing a short wrap-up video about all of the books I read in July. Um, I'll count them at the end because I'm not prepared. Uh, we've got construction going on next door, of course. It's okay. Um, there's a couple of my books I don't have physical copies of because they were either Kindle or I've lent them to someone or I borrowed them from the library. Um, so I'll see if I can figure out how to insert photos. I might not care enough. We'll see. Uh, okay, so looking back at my Goodreads list, the first book I finished in July was The Queen of the Damned by Anne Rice. This is uh, the third book in the Vampire Chronicles. I had uh, just finished reading Vampire Lestat and Interview with the Vampire. Um, I had read them before. It's been like over 10 years. I really didn't remember much about the books. Uh, so I was rereading them to see if they were books I still wanted to keep. And turns out, yeah, I like the mythology of, of this vampire world. Um, I find, I find the way that Anne Rice in these books, I don't, I haven't read anything recent of hers, but in these books, I'm intrigued by how she's using the mythology of the vampire to very much wrestle with the ideas of like good and evil and ethics and morality and all of that. Um, sometimes it gets a bit long winded, but oh well. Um, so Queen of the Damned, book number three. Uh, this one is definitely much more action-packed than the previous two books. Um, of the three, this was the one that I had the most come back to me from having read it. If you've read it, um, then you know that um, the story of the Legend of the Twins, that is the origin story, is woven throughout this book. And as I started reading it, I was remembering, oh wait, yeah this is familiar. I remember reading this. And I thought it, you know, I thought it was a good time. I, um, not interested enough to keep reading with the books. I feel like her writing style is definitely changing enough and there's just other things I want to read more. Um, but yeah, so that was the first book I read. Then I read Children of Virtue and Vengeance by Tomi Adeyemi. This is the sequel to Children of Blood and Bone. I gave this and Children of Blood and Bone three out of five stars. They're okay. I like them. I don't love them. They have a lot of hype. But, you know, here, here's... My short summary is the world is amazing. The plot is okay. The writing is meh. The romance didn't need to be there. Um, I can definitely, you know, when I first read Children of Blood and Bone, um, it was kind of one of my first forays getting back into reading, and I was like, oh yeah, this is really interesting, such a different world. There's, because I love, like, fantasy stories, but there's so much of the fantasy, especially that I read growing up, that's so influenced by traditional Western mythology. It's, it's very much like... Influenced by Lord of the Rings, influenced by The Legend of Arthur, that'll make a comeback in this reading list. Very much just like magic, dragons, um, knights, and that, that kind of mythology. So it was very refreshing to see um, um, a magic style a world of gods, a world of aesthetics that doesn't have any of that. So like that was very beautiful and creative and interesting and I very much appreciate that world. The writing style was not the most elegant, not the most refined. Um, Bow Ties and Books is a, is a, a YouTuber that did a uh, reading vlog 
of reading these two books and they do a better job of really analyzing the writing style and the character development and everything um so i like these books i see where the hype is but i think a lot of the hype comes from a market that is full of readers who haven't read a lot of books that branch out like this so yeah the first couple you're going to read are going to feel so amazing and then you're going to get into other books that are uh have more polished writing styles have better character development and like i love them they're beautiful i'm going to keep them i'm going to continue with the series but it was okay where do i put you okay then um, this was, uh, speaking of bow ties and books, this was a strong recommendation from them. This is called Freshwater by Akweke Amezi. Um, Amezi just had a new book released called The Death of Vivek Oji. Oji? Um, so this is, Akweke Amezi is a non-binary author, and this is a book that follows the story of Ada, who is born in Nigeria and then eventually comes to the U.S. to study, and they describe her as like a child who's born with like gods in her body, um, and then um, a trauma while she's at school awakens one of the god, one of these deity beings in particular, um, who very much rises to the surface to protect her and it's it's not like a, a it's not a fantasy book it's closer to like a fictionalized memoir and it very much plays on the idea of um i contain multitudes which is a summary that i hear a lot of trans and non-binary people say in trying to explain how you know the appearance of their body isn't quite the sum of who they feel they are the writing is beautiful the it's it's not very long i think i read it in like a day or a day and a half it's just an interesting journey in the story of this person discovering the various facets of themselves and how those various beings within them navigate the world. Um, anyway, so that was book number three. Uh, then I read part... Uh, the first installment of the graphic novel, The Wicked and the Divine, The Faust Act. This is by Jillian McKelvey and Wilson Cowles. This is this, here, I'll just read the back. Every 90 years, 12 gods return as young people. They are loved, they are hated. In two years, they are all dead. It's happening now, it's happening again. Um, and in this, story um these 12 gods come back as pop stars they come back as celebrities it follows a young girl who goes to see the god amaterasu in concert um she makes it backstage and then starts witnessing a bunch of events someone is out to um destroy and delegitim delegitimize these um reincarnated gods ahead of the two years and um so this mortal girl is kind kind of starts to become a reporter kind of starting to like figure things out and figure out like who on the suspect list can be accounted for who like who's doing this and why um there's also a uh a reporter who's very much a skeptic who's very much like I don't believe that you're gods I don't believe that this is magic but then they are also very much confronted with they're seeing things that they can't really trust with their own eyes and what does that mean um, and then also all of the portrayals of the gods are fucking beautiful this is one of the first gods you meet Lucy 
Short for Lucifer. Yum. Okay, the next book I read that uh, I don't have the physical copy of because I lent it to my dad is The Historian by Elizabeth Kostova. This is um, a book that follows three different storylines, but it's um, a historian, his student, a historian, along with an archaeologist, and then the, his, the second historian's daughter, three different timelines, um, are all following the history and origin story of Dracula. Um, so this book is very like slow and dense because, you know, it's not Indiana Jones looking for Dracula. It's a historian and an archaeologist. <laughs> They're very thorough. There's lots of talking about, you know, finding old manuscripts and falling apart books and scrolls and like examining, oh wait, they signed this, you know, receipt in Cyrillic letters, but at the time they were speaking Greek. So, you know, getting into all of the historical implications of following this historical trail. Um, but with that, it is beautiful. It made me want to travel so much. Um, especially because, like, they talk about some cities that I've actually been to. You know, they talk about the cafes in Amsterdam and the streets in Dubrovnik and um, a lot of cities, cities that I want to go to. They talk about Sarajevo, they talk about Istanbul, um, they talk about all these small towns in the Carpathians. Um, so it's a slow read, but this, the settings are just so beautifully described and the thoroughness is just part of this experience. Um, and, and, it, and it's, a, it's a vampire book, you know, it's, it's definitely not as exciting as, you know, Anne Rice vampires, but it is very interesting to, um, you know, explore the origin of that myth and to trace, you know, not just like, how did Dracula come to be, but where has he appeared in history and where have his servants uh, shown up trying to preserve his body and where have the people who have fought him shown up in history and what their legacy is. Um, so, uh, and, and that was another, that was another book that I had read, didn't remember any of it. Um, so it was like reading a brand new book and it was a good time. And I lent it to my dad because, um, he, for the same reason that I loved it, of like it made me want to travel and it very much reminded me of places that I have traveled to and made me feel nostalgic in this time when we just have to stay home. So I lent it to him to, you know, see if he would enjoy it as well. Okay, the next book I finished that I started quite a while ago um, was an audiobook of How to Be an Anti-Racist by Ibram X. Kendi. Um, this was um, probably the first like actual anti-racist book I'd actually picked up and read. I am very fortunate that my through my job I've been able to go to a lot of equity and inclusion seminars and he, you know, like I've, he, I've heard Robin DiAngelo speak and I've, I've heard a bunch of other people moderate different discussions. Um, so it's not the first time that I was engaging in this kind of work, but it was like the first actual book I read. Uh, and the format of this book is, at the start of each chapter, um, Kendi will define a type of racism, like he'll define like nas nationality, like racism based on nationality, racism based on skin color, racism based on economics, racism based on gender and sexuality. Um, and then he, within the chapter, he'll like give examples from his own life, give examples in the way that this racism is um, enacted by intentionally racist people, and then how policies within our country either reinforce or have worked to dismantle these institutional racist pillars. Um, so I 
and and also the book is narrated by the author um so uh i love the audiobook um i'm glad that this is an audiobook i actually own and not when i rented this is something i would like to get a physical copy of to be able to go back and reference um and it's it's it, it's not just like a good introduction to like how to be an anti-racist um but like the takeaway is like let's start like i said like examining the different pillars of racist societies like how do these things you know we're no longer dealing with racist people we're dealing with racist systems and and that's what i think a lot of people are coming to terms with now is all of the racist people could up and disappear and marginalized communities would still suffer because the systems in place are still functioning to their disadvantage and i think this book definitely is an exercise in examining those patterns and examining how those structures came to be and how even like well-intentioned things can be misleading when you don't have the right people in the room influencing those decisions so highly recommend good uh so the next book i read was a book that i've had since i was a child uh this is indian captive the story of mary jemison by lois lemsky this is a middle grade reader and it's a uh fictionalized retelling of um the white girl mary jemison whose family was killed by indigenous people but then she was adopted into um their tribe uh she was adopted into um a seneca tribe and the reasoning they give is one of um the young warriors of this tribe was killed in a battle with white settlers so as a fair um re rebuttal okay you kill one of ours we're gonna take one of yours that's fair right like it's fair um so this is the story of how she comes to how she's wrestling with being a captive having her family being killed um but then learning how to live with the Seneca people, learning their their farming methods, learning their language, learning their culture, um, making friends with the other children. Um, and uh, I went in, because this book was written in, nine, no, was it written in, hold on. This book was written in 1941 by a white woman. So I went in expecting to be disappointed in its telling. And I was actually quite surprised by it. And I did like a teensy bit of research on it. And for the time, this author did a lot of research. Um, she, I mean, it's worth noting that most of her research was, was talking to like um, university anthropologists, going to museums, um, and well, who, who are these, you know, who are the museum curators? Who are these, um, anthropologists? Who are these, um, university faculty? Odds are it's a lot of white men. But, okay for the time she tried to do a lot of research and she tried to give as accurate a portrayal as she was able in a book aimed at kids to portray the society of of the seneca people um and you know at the end of the book um mary jameson is is given the opportunity to go back to living with white settlers and she decides against it because she's going to go back to white people and they're just they're either going to not want to talk about what happened to her or 
they're gonna just treat her as like a lady who can't do anything or oh your history is like this terrible thing that happened to you she like to go live with white people is to be with people who don't understand what she's been through whereas if she stays with the seneca these are people who you know they understand the pain of her losing her family because it is happening to them all the time they are not just losing their family they're losing their lands they're losing their way of life um and these are the people who have taught her to you know respect and love the earth and have a strong body and have a strong spirit um so there's a lot in the story that is fictionalized i saw some critiques where she where the author it says it's a story of mary jemison but it's kind of combining the stories of several indian captives that we have historical accounts of um so you know that this isn't necessarily a book that i would want like school children to read about today i would definitely want something that has more of an own vo voices influence but for the time like you know i I, I say that like with air quotes because like I don't want to just ignore whatever racism is inherent in the context of writing this book but I think for the time you know understanding that I can't judge it through a modern lens because it's not a mo modern book um, I think it tried to be accurate and it tried to be um, generous with its story and in not painting indigenous people as, you know, the enemy that you would grow up seeing on cowboys and Indians, but trying to represent them as this complex culture that, while different from white people, was, you know, was a full complex civilized culture in its own right so yeah it was a, it was you know the experience of reading it i think was like maybe more interesting than the story so the next book i read uh i don't have a copy of because i borrowed it from the library it is foundry side by robert jackson bennett this was um this and the next two books are the books that I talk about a little bit in my three book wrap up video, which is my first video. So in that video, I gush a little bit about how I think it's really cool that the magic is very much like a magical interpretation of com computer coding. Um, I don't really go into like what the whole story is about. Uh, so the, the story is you follow a thief named Sanchia who has this sensitivity to the sigils the the magical symbols that are used for um enchanting everyday objects with magic and um she accidentally steals something that is a uh, a lot more important and uh, um she gets in over her head but also starts to peel back some of the layers of this society and the society is divided into four big merchant houses that control um all of the enchanting of objects and then foundry side are is like the the shanty towns and the harbor towns that live between the big neighborhoods that hold these houses so um there's definitely an interesting um examination of class between you know the people who have the power and the people who don't but e but even beyond like the divide it's also very much about the sins that are committed in the name of advan of societal advancement in the name of military advancement and and the repercussions of um playing with people's lives it's action-packed I love the characters. I can't read the we the, read the second one. The waiting list is like 112 people on five copies on my library. But um, it's very exciting. I love it. Um, so the next book I read, also something I talked about in the first video, is The Inconvenient Indian 
A Curious Account of Native People in North America by Thomas King. Um, I'll go, I talk more in depth, in depth in my other video, but this is, um, Thomas King, um, loosely tells the history of Indigenous people in America and Canada through a combination of personal anecdotes and historical anecdotes and personal musings. It's not a linear historical telling. It's each chapter is a theme. So it's like the value of land or um, Indians in, that's the word he, he uses, Indians in media, um, the like question of assimilation. So each chapter will have a theme. He'll talk about that theme kind of in chronological order and then the next chapter will start over. So that method in terms of it not being super dense history was more easy for my brain to absorb. I think it's a, it's a good kind of starting point to just learning some of the history that your, your middle school textbook didn't teach you. Um, okay, so the next book I read, which I also gushed about in that video, The Starless Sea by Erin Morgenstern. Um, this is a beautiful, lush, heavily descriptive fantasy. Um, Go, go watch that first video for more details. This book was beautiful. Um, Aaron Morgenstern is also the author of The Night Circus, which just became available in my library and I downloaded to my Kindle, so I'm super excited to read that. Um, I uh, compared, if you get these references, I compared this world, it kind of reminds me of the Keys to the Kingdom series by Garth Nix even though that's like a young adult middle grade series. Um, the descriptions kind of remind me of like a mist game a little bit, just aesthetically and like the lushness of talking about how beautifully designed everything is. Um, so that was lovely. That was one of my favorite books I've read so far this year. Okay. Next book, this one was also borrowed from my library. This might be my favorite book that I have read this year. Uh, this is Jade City by Fonda Lee. Uh, so this book is, um, it's a book heavily influenced by um, mobster stories. So it's like, you know, The Godfather meets Avatar and Kung Fu. Okay, so the story is, I'm gonna forget the names of everything because I have a memory like a goldfish. Um, takes place on a city that has this magical mineral, Jade, that infuse people of a certain um, lineage with enhanced abilities. Uh, the author describes, you know, basically trying to find an explanation for how all the fighters in kung fu movies can, you know, punch their opponents through walls and, you know, leap over buildings. Um, so the, the Jade gives these people that ability. Not everybody can um, handle it. There's another portion of local populace that um, have no reaction to it. It just, it doesn't do anything to them. Um, and then there's also like outside people, people from other um, nationalities that they do react to it, but because they, but because it's basically like a drug, it's a performance enhancement drug, um, the local people have to go to through very rigorous training to be able to basically not be consumed by the power that carrying Jade does to their body. What is that grammar? I don't know. Um, so, so that's the world, um, and the story is the, that the country is basically run by two, by two family clans who've kind of butted heads in the past, um, and, they're, and they're basically um, mob families, but instead of being at odds with the actual government, it's a symbiotic relationship. Um, it's basically like the 
country officials being like, there is dirty business involved in keeping the peace and running the country, and, and we're just going to let the families handle it. Um, so various things happen without giving too much away. The families go to war with each other. Um, so the, a lot of the book is about um, the clan war and the um, challenges it poses to family loyalty, to clan loyalty, to the good of the country. Um, and then uh, they're also faced with threats basically of colonialism, of uh, this country has survived a war with outsiders who are very much implied to be like the Americans and the Chinese. And I think this country is supposed to kind of be Japan, but it's, but it's fantasy. So, but this nation is also threatened by these other countries who lost the war, but still have the foothold and want, they want in on the jade economy. They want... You know, some of them benefit from the stability of the country. Some of them are, will benefit from the turmoil. So I think that's what the next book is going to delve into. The next book is called Jade War. Um, I love this book. I I love the world. I felt like the the rules around the magic were very consistent. Every character was so well written. I was so invested in everyone. Um, and... I just, I just love the details. It's such like a fully formed society. Um, and yeah, I can't wait to read the next one. Um, okay. And the last book I read in July is Hexwood by Diana Wynne Jones. This is another book from my bookshelves that I did not remember anything about. Um, and this is the only book in my pile that's going to go in my to give away or sell pile. Uh, this is, there is so much going on in this book and that was kind of my issue with it. It's like half fantasy, magical world, um, time out of order book that has a lot of nods to the Arthurian legend and then the other half is like science fiction space overlords are in control of these machines that can warp time like it was both dense fantasy and science fiction and I didn't feel like those two pieces meshed together um I finished it, but at the end of it, I was just like, I am so ready for this story to be over. Um, I, I like the writing. I love the characters. Like, like this is clear. Like, I've read a couple of other of Dana Wynne Jones books, and, like, I'm excited to go back and read some of her other works again. I just think that, like, this was an experiment in combining some different elements, and I don't think it was that successful. I went and read some reviews, and a lot of them were like, oh, my God in reading this again, reading it the second time, um, suddenly I got so much more out of it and I was seeing everything that would happen. And I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, I, I kind of get that. Um, like I'm totally for a book that has more to give upon rereading it, but I feel like I need to ha be kind of caught by it the first time. And I feel like if you weren't super familiar with like the King Arthur and Merlin legend, there's even some references to like Nordic mythology in here and like Beowulf and like, I don't like that. I feel like I couldn't enjoy the story because I wasn't catching on these references. And I think like a lot of the references were just kind of like here and there. And then a bunch of stuff came together at the end and I felt it was messy. I felt like it was messy. You know, I don't mind a book that references like other literature and other things, but I don't like that this story felt dependent on you knowing that stuff. Um, so, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, I'll give it like three stars, but I'm like, 
I don't really want to bother reading it again. I, there's other things that um, just were easier for me to enjoy. Um, okay, so how many how many books was that? Hold on, twelve. I read twelve books. Well, eleven books and one graphic novel. So cool. All right. Um, let me know if you like this video. Let me know in the comments. Have you read any of these books? Do you have questions about them? Do you have suggestions of books I should read, depending on what you heard me talk about? Let me know. Um, I hope you have a good rest of your day. I hope you learned something cool today. Um, Black Lives Matter. Uh, I have a link in my description box to donate to bail funds across the country. Um, all right, I'll catch you in my next video. Bye.